Good evening, everyone. Why don't we get started? Uh, Marin Energy Authority special meeting uh, for Wednesday, December 12th. This is actually a reschedule of our uh, regular meeting, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I know we're under some time constraints. Folks need to get out of here by before seven, mm -hmm. I believe, yep. to, to make it to some okay <laughs> to make it to some seven o'clock engagement. So we're probably not going to get through the whole agenda tonight, and as we go along, we'll flag issues that uh, we'll take up at our next regular meeting. Um, but with that, why don't we get going with item one, board announcements? Doesn't look like we have any this evening. Item two is public open time. Amy, members of the public. <laughs> Likewise, any comment? It doesn't look like it. So moving on to item three, report from executive officer. Hey, I have just a couple of quick items this morning or this evening. I wanted to let folks know that we did approve a contract with the Sonoma County Water, Water Agency to provide some advisory services to them related to their CCA efforts. So that is now in place. Also, our technical committee has been canceled for the month of December, but our executive committee will be held as usual on the third Wednesday, which falls on December 19th at 9 a.m. Uh, the agenda packet will be going out um, either um, later this evening or tomorrow morning. Um, the holiday party will be held on December 21st, as you all hopefully know, 6.30 to 10 at the Falkirk um, in San Rafael. It's a potluck, as usual, and um, you can connect with Darlene and let her know. Uh, you can RSVP with her, let her know what you plan to bring so that we can fill in any uh, missing areas uh, on the menu that night. Um, and that's it for my report. Great. Any questions for Donna? Okay, seeing none, item four, consent calendar. We are going to have a chance to review that. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? That matter carries. All right, moving right along. Item five, appointment of board members to MEA committees. Great. So um, I'll just make a couple of comments on this item. We have, uh, as it as we have grown to include the city of Richmond in our board, we now are able to add one additional seat to our executive committee. And um, so we have invited council member Butt to join us on the executive committee to fill that additional seat. And um, so that is um, one of the items that, that is part of this um, board item on the agenda. Uh, and then also I wanted to talk a little bit about the ad hoc rate setting committee, which needs to be formed for our upcoming rate setting cycle for um, fiscal year 13-14. And this um, ad hoc rate setting committee will be established to meet at least one time in January. Uh, there may be a need for a second meeting sometime in February, uh, but um, we, we don't know that for a fact yet. But, so it could be a very uh, a very small commitment uh, or a medium-sized commitment, but it won't be too much of a long-term commitment. Um, several board members have expressed interest in being on the ad hoc rate setting committee. Um, and that includes uh, Chair Connolly, uh, Director Butt, and Director Riff, uh, excuse me, um, Director Hawk has been has expressed an interest. And then um, we've also uh, uh, discussed this with Director Riff and there may be interest there. So, and there's also room for one more if there's an interest in uh, being on the ad hoc rate setting committee meetings. So, uh, oh, I see. Uh, Director Green is expressing interest. Uh, yes. Yes, okay, very good. Okay, great, thank you for stepping up. So I think that's fully subscribed now. Yep. Do we need a motion? We need a motion on each, the executive okay. committee and the ad hoc group setting committee. Why don't we take XCOM first, so addition of Director Butt I'll to move. the executive committee. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, that matter carries. Now the ad hoc rate setting committee, um, the aforementioned uh, Folks, um, can I have a motion on I'll that? that plate. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter carries. Any further committee discussions, mm -hmm. Donna? No, that's it for that okay, item. Okay, great. Item um, six, we're going to defer. That's a report from AFCO on market research. We want to spend some time on that, but that information is in. I think you guys will find that very interesting um, at the next meeting. Item seven and eight, let's skip over momentarily. We may have time 
to cover those. Um, item nine, <clears throat> we're going to uh, defer. I don't see Becky here tonight. <clears throat> so item ten, um, Don, why don't you take up this item? Sure. So um, as NEA has been growing quite a bit over the, the last few months. We've been adding staff uh, bit by bit, and we've gotten to the point where we are needing more office space, sort of doubling up on offices, and we're um, often uh, double booking the conference room and uh, just needing more space in general to um, allow for the, the daily operations of, um, of the agency. We've looked at a number of options for expansion, including uh, other locations. We've looked at the possibility of relocating to space um, in, within this complex in a different um, suite that, that has more space. And we've also looked at the possibility of staying where we are but adding on some uh, an adjacent suite that um, has uh, about the right amount of space for our needs. Uh, after looking at the options that are out there, um, we, we, uh, came, we've come forward with a recommendation tonight, and I'll say a little bit about how we came to this conclusion, and then also invite Director Rifkind to weigh in as he uh, became very involved. Um, the Executive Committee discussed this, and, and Director Rifkind became very involved in helping us with the final stages of negotiations. Um, some of the things that are important to us um, in, in determining what space makes sense um, are uh, making sure that there is um, meeting accessibility. Obviously, we have frequent public meetings that require large spaces such as this room and then smaller spaces such as the, um, the adjacent meeting rooms, the borough room included. Um, also, having a, an in-house conference room is, um, is important as we have uh, meetings throughout the day um, that, that require that. Um, having a, lo a location with close proximity to a uh, main transit hub is important. We actually have uh, several uh, employees that commute by bus, uh, which is great because it keeps our uh, carbon footprint down. Um, and so the, the, the um, physical location is important. And as we've expanded to Richmond, having a location that is close to the 580 freeway has also served to be beneficial and is a factor that we considered as we looked at other spaces. Um, also of, of importance is, is ADA accessibility, both for our employees and for our meeting spaces. That's not available in all of uh, the spaces that we looked at. Um, it is available here. Um, the ability to expand incrementally as the agency grows is something that, that has served us well here and is something that um, uh, may continue to be a need that we have. And last of all, um, but not least, is um, LEED certification is a bonus because it aligns with the agency's mission. Um, uh, to, to operate in a sustainable manner. So those are some factors that we took into account. And obviously another uh, factor is price. You know, are we getting uh, value for, um, for the price that we pay for the, the space? So there were a limited number of spaces that met the key criteria that we looked at. And um, after some, some review and exploration, we determined that staying with the remaining space um, would make the most sense for the agency at this time. And after some, some discussions with um, Seagate, the property owner here, um, we uh, were able to come to some uh, agreed, ter agreed upon terms that were, were actually um, looked beneficial and uh, enabled us to actually uh, consider a, a slightly longer term than we were uh, originally contemplating. So um, the, what's being recommended before you here, I, I wanted to, um, go over a couple of the adjustments to the original proposed lease am amendment that was sent out in the board packet. There were some negotiations occurring in the week leading up to the board meeting, and those negotiations resulted in four adjustments, which are, should be um, uh, at each of your seats. You should have this list of four adjustments. And I just want to go over these because the document that you received in your original board packet um, did not account for these four adjustments. And these are all actually improvements, so it's, it's all good news here. Um, and I promise after this, um, Len, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> Just giving a thorough overview here. So um, the first item is um, we were able to decrease um, uh, in the expense pass-throughs. So 
Um, for those of you familiar with uh, commercial lease agreements, there's uh, often a requirement that you pay a portion of the operating expenses of the building, and those can go up um, every year, and it, it's helpful, it's better to have a, uh, a year that's not too far back. It's better to have a more current year. So we were able to um, shift the base year from 2010 to 2013. So that's a, a benefit in our annual pass-through costs. The second item is, uh, by increasing the term of the agreement, we we're able to um, decrease the escalation rate. So um, the expiration date has been extended to December 2019, and the annual 3% escalation rate um, will become effective on January 1st, 2016. So it won't go into effect before that, which is um, uh, an, an added benefit. The third item is we requested an option to extend, which um, really just provides us a little bit of flexibility as we get close to the end of the term. If we choose to stay in the site, um, we, would, we would have you know, first right of refusal, we'd have the ability to extend the agreement, um, or we could choose to uh, move to another location at that time, but that provision has been added in. And then the fourth item really was a, a very big win here. This was not contemplated in the draft that you all received, but the landlord has offered or agreed to cover all of the tenant improvements. Um, that includes two items. One is uh, carpeting of the space. Right now, there's some, um, it's, it's splotchy cement floor, so there does need to be some uh, floor covering. So they'll be taking care of the carpeting. Um, they'll also be taking care of creating an opening between the two spaces. So um, there's a, a hallway that um, will open into the new space. The two spaces actually used to be joined together, and, um, so they'll just be recreating that opening uh, for us. So those are the four changes um, from the agreement that you all have seen. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Director of Time for um, additional comments. Well, I think Donnie stole all my thunder. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess I want to say to my fellow directors, um, my concern when I first heard about this in the executive committee was, whoa, we have to be very careful. We're a governmental agency, nonprofit, you know, public perception being in a in a very nice uh, complex like the Santa Fe Corporate Center, boy, we could probably find less expensive space in other areas in Marin County. Uh, like there was some discussion, for, you know, in Northern Santa Fe and and perhaps the Belmar and Keys area of Nevada. There's certainly less expensive space. But when we added in all the factors that uh, Don has mentioned, nothing quite met this, and and and. One significant thing, I think it's mentioned in the, in the staff report, this is almost $1,000 a month between a meeting room like this and, a, and, a, and other conference rooms that, that the agency needs. But this is really pretty convenient. And, and, the, and the extra effort that it would take staff to move to an offsite location every time for this is also a fairly big expense that would probably not uh, considered in here in terms of the cost to staff time to relocate to some other location, perhaps in San Rafael. So um, I think that it's not inexpensive, but there's other public agencies that are here at approximately the same price, namely TAM and 10,000 Degrees. Well, I guess that's a nonprofit, it's not a governmental agency, but we're not the only, one, only ones here. But for all the things that Dan, Don talked about, overall, I really think it, it makes sense for us to do this. And we have, they gave some concessions to keep us in, and at least we have some flexibility to be here for a long time if we should choose. So that's why I support uh, <coughs> the, the amendment that's before us. Well, I want to uh, thank <laughs> Director Ripkind for his involvement. Um, he really brought his professional expertise to bear on this. I think um, as a direct result of your involvement, the, the terms really improved over time. Um, so appreciate your comments. Um, any board questions on, on the lease director but um, obviously I'm a late comer to this and I, I, I don't have any criticisms of it but I guess I'm used to um, uh, having a, an initial discussion about these kind of things in closed session and ultimately they have to be approved in open session but it's, it's, it's a little unusual for me is there some reason that maybe you guys have already done that before yeah, we typically bring this type of discussion to our executive committee, um, which we did this time, uh, and then to the board. Our, I don't know if we have a different uh, 
municipal council parameters that we have to follow, but our municipal council is pretty stingy with the closed sessions. And uh, we, all, we really um, have only been able to hold closed session meetings if there's a potential legal issue at, in play, but not for lease <coughs> negotiations. Uh, but we'd we, certainly be willing to explore that further. Are we run by the Brown Act? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They allow, I mean, real estate negotiations is one of the they want to be allowed the uh, use of a closed session under the ground. Fair point. So I guess um, I guess I would answer your, your question on this is that you're absolutely right in the Brown Act and, mm -hmm. and my city council in Larkspur certainly we discuss <coughs> real estate issues in closed session. This this particular lease amendment has been brought to the full board's attention, I think, at the previous meeting, then it was vetted at the executive committee, then it went down to a, a little s subcommittee of Don and Emily and myself, and and it's subject to board approval or disapproval tonight, so I feel like there's enough oversight and approval to, the, you know, to consider it. Um, and, and, you know, so if you have specific questions about it or, you know, if you're not comfortable, you know, let us know. I mean, certainly, you know, going forward, depending upon how this agency grows, there are going to be an opportunity to move to another county, maybe one day. I don't know. That's a that's a huge step. But right now, right now, it's you know, you know the majority of the agencies and the staff are, are kind of brand based, so that's why it seems to make sense to be where we are at least for the time being. Okay, thank you. Very small. I I just like to add that oftentimes my understanding is with real estate. That's oftentimes when you're discussing um, the cost of the land, and there's certain issues that you know could be not to benefit to the community if it's discussed initially in open session. Whereas with this agency, that is oftentimes scrutinized by the residents for simply negotiating a cost to lease, is something that I think is is more appropriate to be discussed in open session, so that no resident who may have been critical of this agency. Uh, in the past would find some reason to be concerned or use that as a point for for complaint. So I think it's a different issue. I don't think that we, it's not like we have a land price at, at stake because we're discussing an open session. So I, I think it's a little bit different issue and I appreciate the fact that it was all discussed in open session just so that they can all see we're on the up and up. And a lot of good research was done. Right. I mean, there are times where, for example, if we're talking about energy prices, that there will be, we have an ad hoc committee uh, that, that is below the threshold that needed to be public, and that's obviously for competitive reasons, but I tend to agree with Director Small, I think, in this situation. Any further questions or comments, members of the public, on this item? Yes. Uh, I apologize that this came up at a previous meeting, uh, but the fact that PG&E is on this campus as well has been enormously beneficial. It means that when customers come to PG&E and have questions about their bill, and PG&E can answer it, they can direct them right upstairs to us. And I know that I've taken customers down. Uh, I helped a customer uh, enroll in a care program who was a non-English uh, speaking customer. Um, so the proximity of, of having PG&E nearby, that does All right, I'll entertain the motion. Um, <coughs> Second. All in favor of approving the lease. Aye. 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 Opposed, that matter carries. Okay, circling back to item seven, Don, does that make sense at this point? Yeah, here again, that just lost it. Yeah, actually, let's take up item eight, and then if there's time, we'll do item seven. Okay. Item eight should be for the <laughs> For the record, how I understand this is that I have an hour to bring you up <laughs> non regulatory. So, everybody, get ready for the excitement um, because the end of the year does get pretty zippy amount around um, the Public Utilities Commission. Um, we have been. We have, is this one? Okay, I'm entrusted with a clicker. I don't know how this works. Um, can I make this? There we go. Okay, now we're cooking. Um, so 
I just wanted to um, let you all know that the, the last uh, California Public Utilities Commission meeting of the year is coming up uh, on the 20th. And uh, we've been extraordinarily busy with proposed decisions coming out so they can be voted on by the end of the year. It requires a 30-day notice period. Um, the first set of, you know, since these proposed decisions tend to come out at the last, uh, on the last possible day, uh, we've had a lot of filings uh, subsequent to the packet, which you'll be seeing in the next board meeting packet. Um, but I did want to highlight a couple of key items that we've been working on here. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll, I'll touch on four items. One is a petition for rulemaking on cost allocation, uh, cost allocation issues that stems out of Senate Bill um, 790 that is uh, addressing some some issues that were raised in recent CCA legislation, Senate Bill 790. The next item we're gonna talk about is the proposed pg and &E PCIA. There was a recent update on what this exit fee is gonna look like. There is also a proposed decision out for the Code of Conduct, which is a second component of SB 790, and the pg and &E general rate case. So, By the way, there's gonna be a quiz for Bob. There is, as, yeah, the director may not know, but there, there is a pop quiz. Shortest, a lot. There is a pop quiz at the end of every regulatory update. So I don't know if you know about this MEA tradition, but it's called trial by fire. <laughs> so the first item that I want to talk to you about is um, a petition for rulemaking on cost allocation. The This document is contained in the supplemental packet since it was it came out shortly after the main packet came out. Um, this received really good press in California energy markets. And what it addresses is cost allocation, cross subsidization uh, issues that were excluded from the scope of the code of conduct proceeding. And so the idea here is the requests are asked in this is to uh, to develop cost allocation principles. So to ensure that costs are properly functionalized between the generation and distribution rates so that our customers are paying fair costs. Um, a phase out of stranded cost recovery by IOUs. So to ensure that there's a tapering off and an eventual elimination of exit fees that our customers pay. This has been causing our customers a lot of, um, and us, a lot of frustration. Um, a reform of non-bypassable charges. This is uh, components that the commission has determined everybody benefits, so everybody should pay, but there aren't necessarily um, stringent rules in place for clearly delineating when everybody benefits. Are the exit fees, you're talking about the PCIA fees? Yes, yeah, PCIA and other exit fees. There's there's a component of exit fees, including but this. But basically the PCIA, but PCIA is, is the main problem. problem. Yeah, and so this is the uh, power charge indifference adjustment, uh, which actually I'll be touching on in a later slide, so. What's an example, example of a non-bypassable charge? Yeah, one example is the cost allocation mechanism, which uh, requires us to pay for uh, resource adequacy costs where there is determined to be a local or system area reliability need. Um, so again, it's a determination that everybody benefits from a specific facility being online. Um, but again, we're going to be delving into these details uh, coming up soon. Um, an additional requirement is to uh, impose new transparency requirements on investor and utilities. So really, in applications that the utilities submit, they should have a showing of who is benefiting from the uh, proposed program. And right now, there isn't a requirement to specifically delineate who is benefiting from the program that they're proposing. And so when the commission is taking a look at these applications, and then taking a look at the proposed cost allocation, which is often in the distribution rate, which our customers include and pay, um, there isn't necessarily enough information for the commission to make a well-guided well decision on, on who should pay uh, and who benefits. Uh, the next component is also a burden of proof, uh, which is to say, 
it relates to the transparency point. If you want a cost allocation different from how the benefits are structured, you have to you have to meet a higher criteria of um, showing that there's a there's a specific policy compelling policy reason to change the cost allocation. So what burden of proof is that? Yeah. Well, we will be. Hundreds, clear and convincing. You know, so essentially, a reasonable doubt. <laughs> <laughs> um, as much as we'd like to see beyond a reasonable doubt, I don't think we'll get it. Um, you know, essentially, we are. This petition is the first step. So this is what this petition is going to function to do is for the commission to develop an order instituting rulemaking, and so that will set forth the scope of a proceeding, and will hopefully touch on all of these items. And then as that proceeding moves forward, there will be um, comments, there will be testimony, there will be briefing to develop a more complete set of rules, um, revisions to existing policies that were put into place prior to the, prior to the enactment of SB 790. So this is just the first step. We haven't fleshed out, we haven't fleshed out the details. These are, these are proposals. Um, and then the last item is in Senate Bill 790, you know, it, it urges the commission to draw up any additional rules and pr procedures that it finds necessary or convenient to facilitate CCA, um, to um, address cost allocation issues and other non bypassable charge issues. So just, you've, you've all seen the slide before, um, this is just again, an overview of the components that SB 790 touches on. And we're, we're talking about in this, uh, in this petition for rulemaking, creating a fair, fair playing field and preventing cross organization. <coughs> the CCA autonomy component is, is not as, um, as prominent in this, in this proceeding. So this was a very significant effort. MEA took the lead on this uh, on this petition for rulemaking, and we ended up being joined by many other co-petitioners. Um, a lot of these folks are in the direct access world or in the environmental world and support CCA. Um, the reason for this is so um, for people who are on direct access, they've been facing a lot of the same exit fee issues cost allocation issues as we face. Um, but this new legislation really solidifies and clarifies what is needed from the commission to really make changes there. And furthermore, not everybody signed on as a petitioner, but there are a lot of folks who um, support our petition. And so these are the supporting entities for the petition for rulemaking. So there was very broad support um, we had brought this to the attention of all of the commission's offices to the general counsel of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, we really did a lot of legwork before filing this. Um, it, was, it was several months in the making. So, um, are there any questions on the petition for rulemaking? Yes. So what's the procedure after the petition is presented to the CPUC? It's like filing a complaint of some sort. Yeah. And so, so, are there any responding parties like the IOUs, or, and is there ultimately going to be a hearing on this, and how's that supposed yeah. to, just to kind of summarize how that of procedure course. would work? Yeah. So there is um, a comment period where <coughs> folks will be able to respond to our petition, and we will be able to reply to those comments. Um, Due to end of year timing, we ask that those happen in the month of January. So we haven't received confirmation from the administrative law division whether that's been granted or not, but there will be a lot of movement in January, and then it will take uh, the commission a period of time, perhaps months, uh, to determine whether or when it will be bringing up the order instituting rulemaking, so actually starting the proceeding that we're asking for. They'll have hearings, right? Yeah, th there will be uh, there will be a very uh, extensive process once we get to that point. We'll know exactly what the procedural schedule is when the order is. Is it possible that they'll look at this and say no, and just stop, or does it have to go further? I mean, we file this petition. Somebody files an opposition. We file a reply. 
somebody looks at it and is it possible they'll say, no, we don't think we need that now? Or is it the way these rulemaking procedures go that given the setup, it has to go to a hearing? Um, I don't believe that it has to, but I, it would be um, highly unlikely for this uh, petition to not be brought to an order instituting rulemaking just because of the sheer number of parties involved and the issues that it's going to address. So. And my other question. Yeah. You use the word term direct access as describing some of the 40 sure. folks that are behind it. Can you just give me a, a definition of the sure, term access? Sure, of course. Um, <clears throat> Direct access is sort of a distant cousin to CCA. What direct access is, is when um, generally commercial or large industrial customers go to a specific energy provider to serve their specific load. So for example, um, a large grocery store chain or a large commercial chain uh, may want to go on to direct access. There's several um, entities like the most not most parts, but parts of the um, <clears throat> university systems, CSU and UC, are on direct access. So they procure, instead of getting their generation from pg e they get it from an energy service provider. <clears throat> so it's similar to how um, you know customers here in Marin or in Richmond get their energy from us, but then the transmission and distribution still happens from pg e So in certain cases, we're very aligned with them. So cost allocation is one example of that. And in other circumstances, we're not aligned with them when we're looking at um, CCA governance, other uh, energy efficiency is a higher priority for us, um, those sorts of components. But that, that's what, does Can that- Can I just ask yeah. a follow-up question to that? Of course. Can those companies that get direct access, can they get that through us? Can they get direct access through us? So. Could you see come to us and say we want to get our energy from you? If they're in our service territory, then yes. Okay, they have to be. Yeah. yeah, but um, one of the one of the components about direct access is after the energy crisis, there was a cap put on direct access, and there's it's sort of gradually increasing over time, but it's been very limited by the legislature. So um, each time there's been a slight reopening of direct access, there's it's been oversubscribed, and so there's more people who want to be on direct access than are actually on it. So. Um, <coughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions on the cost allocation petition? No, yes. it's not a question. It's a quick comment. In terms of the uh, the objective being leveling the playing field, mm -hmm. uh, whereby uh, the IOU or, or PG&E doesn't get to uh, exploit vagueness and and other kinds of lack of accountability that are built into this, the system, uh, this effort at assuring or ensuring <coughs> accountability and making them play fair, mm -hmm. the quality of it seems to be illustrated by the number of supporters that you've been able to obtain. So really good job. Thank you. Yeah. There's been really well, significant <coughs> written submission in particular was really solid and I think others have commented on that if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> so that's the bulk of the drafting. Good. So Beth, congratulations on the it looks like a monumental amount of work to do this petition. So so good for you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to not having another one come up in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, if there are no other questions on this one, then I'd like to move on to a new topic. Did I see someone in the public who might have had a question on that? Okay. Uh, the next item is the, the PCIA, Power Charge and Difference Adjustment. So, um, for the benefit of our, our new directors, this is um, a, an exit fee that our customers pay that is intended to represent the above market cost of power paid by PG&E for energy procured before the departure of the customer. Sounds confusing, uh, but essentially, if five years ago PG&E entered into a power purchase agreement and it ended up being an expensive one, the customer subsequently leaves. Uh, there's, there's meant to be an exit fee so that uh, the remaining customers at PG&E are not 
uh, uh, negatively impacted. Um, that's the theory. The reality can be a little bit different, um, but we have worked a lot on this methodology in the past couple of years. We've seen some very significant revisions. Um, there was an inclusion of a, a green adder. I'm not going to go back into this because it's sort of revisiting history here. But what I did want to show you is there's been a recent update to what pg projects that their PCA is going to be for this coming year. Um, and it's a significant decrease for us, uh, for our customers. Uh, furthermore, it looks like there's going to be a significant uh, increase in the generation rate being paid by pg and &E customers. So obviously when new customers are taking a look at whether or not they want to be with marine energy or whether they want to return to pg and &E, they look at these factors. So these are not final numbers. There's going to be an annual electric screw up, for short it's AET, that we're going to know at the end of the year. But um, I'm just showing you this right now just so you have a sense of that things, uh, that this uh, reduction in PCA is going to be very beneficial for our customers. Um, yes? Yeah, I'm just still having a hard time understanding how they're getting PCIA because according to them, they're selling more and more power each year, thus no deficit, no loss from pre-purchase power that they're charging our agency. <laughs> So do we have the capacity to actually challenge their numbers? Are we going into the numbers with them, or is it just such a massive undertaking that we're, we're just, you know, we're sort of stuck um, being, uh, you know, an observer? Yeah, so there, there are two components of this. One is each year there's, uh, there's something called the Energy Resource Recovery Account Proceeding, or ERA. Um, that is where you implement the methodologies that are in place. So that's where these numbers are coming out of. We've been involved in this proceeding from the start. We noticed, um, and, and Jeremy, who's here, did a lot of analysis on whether uh, contracts were vintaged properly, basically were they included in the correct year, um, and also whether certain contracts should or should not be included in um, the cost allocation mechanism, the CAM, which we had brought up earlier. And so we noticed a couple of discrepancies there. Uh, it's a little bit on the margins, but still uh, important to keep them honest. Um, but then when you're looking at the secondary component of this is the more structural issues that relate to what are the methodologies that should be, that should be uh, in line here. So when you're looking at the phase out of stranded cost recovery, that's, that's the PCIA. Right, is, right. is there going to be an end to any of these, these exit fees and charges that our customers are paying? And at what point is it just simply just theoretical and not realistic that there's not uh, proper load management being done by the IOUs? So how do you create the right incentives? How do you achieve the right result for customers? Okay. So we're just looking to, to ensure that those methodologies are fair. I mean, would it be worth our agency hiring an economist to take, take them on? Um, well, we are taking them on. The petition for rulemaking will address exactly these issues. Um, we have experts that we use to address these issues and rate design issues. Um, John Delessi, for example, has, has significant expertise, decades of expertise, in these types of rate design issues and achieving a convergence of theory and reality. So um, once, you know, hopefully, Question. Even heads will prevail. Yes. So to follow up on uh, Director Bragman's question, which is a really, really good one, let's go get them. Um, <laughs> as a result of this petition, let's assume uh, that, that MCE and its 40 friends are going to prevail uh, somewhat on the relief that you're seeking. Is there any grab back or reach back if, we sh if it can be demonstrated that PCIA and stranded charges have been overpaid for a number of years? We're talking millions and zillions of dollars potentially here. We just got checks. Yeah, I th you know, when, when we had revised um, the methodologies uh, in the past several years, and there were, uh, that was a, a fairly long negotiation, we had uh, submitted a motion saying we would, like, we would like any revisions to the PCI to be retroactively applied, which is the, the checks that our customers received in the mail. 
So <coughs> you're asking for retroactive relief. We did not ask for retroactive relief because at this point in time, you know, we're seeing this as um, a key policy matter that you know we want the commission to be um, incented to take this up. It's, it's really a matter of um, good governance, so we're not worrying about retroactive at this point in time. We want to first fix, fix the issue and fix the issue going forward. Um, so will everybody be made whole? Um, no, but maybe we can just start with a clean slate. And so that decision that was a policy decision or, I mean, that was decided in-house or among, I mean, was yeah. the, you said that our group, MCE, was the leader on this. Did you consult with the attorneys from the other 40 and collectively <coughs> the consensus was, yeah. boy, if you go ask for retroactive fees, you may really it turn this into a political brouhaha and it's better to get clean rules going forward as opposed to mucking it up from behind us at the idea. There was there were significant um, strategic conversations, extensive strategic conversations regarding um, what is the best approach to achieve the best result. And so on the one hand, if you ask for too little, you're, you might just end up getting too little. If you ask for too much, you might not get anything. And so how do you strike the right balance by framing the issues in a way where um, you know you can you can improve the regulatory processes. You know a lot of these issues, additional information. You know we're not going to go back and make the investor-owned utilities you know demonstrate the factual issues for decisions that have already been approved. I mean, at a certain point, you just have to start fresh and move forward um, and striking that balance was really very thoughtfully discussed. And but the direction is you ultimately, that, I'm just asking, did that come from Don, or how do you ultimately decide uh, how, what the relief is that you're gonna ask for in the petition? Where's, where's that direction come from? Yeah, we've had a, a number of really great consortiums that we've worked with. Um, as, as you may remember, last year, the, the decision that we were focused on was the, the PCIA decision, and we worked with the consortium that included many of the same parties that you see on this on this filing here. Um, and that the, the consortium has been able to have a lot of um, strategic discussions looking at, um, you know, the, the folks involved have been both in the regulatory realm for many years and so bring a lot of experience, but also come at it, at it from different perspectives, different competitive markets, DA providers, ESP providers. Um, and so the um, it really was a collaborative effort. There wasn't, you know, wasn't that MEA had to approve any decision or anyone else had to approve any decision, but it was really a collaborative effort where um, we kind of came to consensus on what was the approach that would have the most traction. Um, we also did some, uh, had some discussions with commissioner's offices, particularly Commissioner Peavy's office. Um, there, there are, um, they were able to provide some uh, su suggestions and guidance uh, there are particular staff people within um, the commission offices that have uh, many years of experience and provided some very useful recommendations to us on how to um, structure things and tailor them so that they would have the most chance of success moving forward. Um, but I also wanted to add that I think the suggestions that you all are making related to retroactive application um, of rules or you know uh, adjusting the PCA, eliminating the PCA, those are all tangible details that could come out of this proceeding that we are launching. And so um, to just a simple answer to your original question, um, Director Bragman, is that um, yes, the PCIA needs to be challenged, and yes, we are challenging it. And that was the first item that Beth was outlining. The PCIA is one big piece of this petition that we have filed. And it's the first time that we have filed a petition um, with this consortium to start a new proceeding. In the past, when we addressed the PCIA issue, we were engaging on a, a petition or a rulemaking that was already in place, and we were weighing in on it. But what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, everybody, we want to start a new conversation here, because this cost allocation stuff is coming up in 10, 20, 15, uh, 50 proceedings and and it's not it doesn't make sense to address it in all those different places we need to have one place for cost 
for allocation is discussed in a comprehensive way so that it can be, the rules can be applied across the board on all the other issues. So we think that that approach is um, strategically makes a lot of sense and it is aimed at addressing the PCIA and other areas where we have cost competitiveness issues. Yeah, I mean, I just think it, we need to keep scrutinizing it because it's beyond paradoxical to me that we can be getting really a, a back charge for electrical power that's being sold elsewhere on the market. I mean, that's clear from their own sales figures. So, um, you know, yeah. if that's what we're doing, I mean, I think that's what we need to be doing is just yeah. continue to be scrutinizing it yeah. every time it comes up. And yeah, and that's exactly how we've been addressing it sort of in each, in each opportunity. And I think that sort of just one additional note on the retroactive application idea is when this came up last time in the in the PCIA discussions in the direct access order instituting rulemaking, uh, which we successfully received retroactive application, that uh, that motion was granted when the issue was already sort of ripe and before the commission there was there was already a direction where there was a consensus that yes, in fact, this methodology needs to be changed. And so at that point in time, we said, okay, everybody agrees the methodology needs to be changed. From this point in time, that's when we want the, from the present point in time, from that point forward, that's when we want the revised methodology to apply. And so I think that we might run into that same scenario if the commission takes up this, this rulemaking. We'll be clearly looking at all of these options. Yeah, I think as long as we make it an issue for them, and they're, it's a theme mm -hmm. for them, that we'll, we'll be going in the right direction in this. So, thank you. Yeah. Alexandra. Is there a short explanation about why their PG&E's rates are supposed to go up about 15%? I, I wish John were here because he is the uh, expert in okay. great design and Greg. Uh, but you know, a lot of this relates to um, you know as as PG&E trends towards um, the renewable portfolio standard 33 um, percent, it's just more expensive energy. Those costs are going to go up. With, you know, yeah, their procurement costs over the last year um, have increased. We are, we're able to see um, the cost of some of the contracts that they enter into. Um, part of it could be related related to renewables, um, but we do, we have seen the market. Um, move up in, in pricing and that's impacted our contracts as well. Um, we're going to have a rate increase um, uh, coming forward in April um, based on our cost of power and so um, we've been in a real trough the last couple of years as far as power supply costs and that's going to go up again in the coming years um, and, and so that's reflected in what's happening with PG&E's rates. Right? Yes, Director. I don't mean to a dead horse, but I can't help myself, so I'll do it. Anyway, I think, uh, I'm just concerned that, I think that the directors of, of MCE should be on board about something as important as a petition being filed. It's like, it's basically, it's like your attorney's filing a lawsuit and you need to know about it, and certainly we don't have anywhere near the expertise that obviously staff has on the, on the details of it. But we should be in on this, you know. And if it's and certainly if there's something that's attorney client that would be subject to a Brown Act, we can have a closed session with the appropriate directors that, that would be to do that. But I'm just suggesting on a on a go forward basis when we're going to invest, obviously the amount of time and effort that staff must have spent to put a petition like that is is enormous. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that that's something. I mean. Like, I'm looking here, like, for example, we have something with Patek that provides, is a contract that provides services to the, you know, that's something that's clearly staff can handle for the most part, and it's kind of a perfunctory contract, but this is kind of a big deal, mm -hmm. what you're doing, and I'm just suggesting, uh, you know, maybe the next time we file a, a major petition with, with CPC, CPUC, that the directors are brought in, you know, and, and at least at some sort of larger, um, director level on, on goals of what we're trying to accomplish, general direction sort of thing. That's what I would encourage on a go-forward basis. I think this one, though, has been a reoccurring item. Am I correct on that? Yeah, the issue has been a, a reoccurring issue. We've been yeah. taking it up in many different proceedings. Our intent sure. here is to kind of consolidate the issue um, so that it can be taken up in one distinct place. Um, 
two things that I'd like to say in response. I think that um, that's a, a great suggestion. It sounds to me like an invitation for us to talk more about regulatory in some of our committee meetings, which we're very happy to do. Um, certainly, uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your committees again? <laughs> Just trying to. I didn't really ask that question. <laughs> I'm also available 24 hours a day <laughs> if anybody wants to talk regulatory. But no, it, it is, you know, that point taken. And um, yeah, this, this is um, a significant recurring theme that essentially, you know, draws upon our, all you know, the, the proceedings that I've been bringing before you. Well, I'd like to make a comment that yeah. since, since we signed up for the JPA probably Two years ago, the PCIA charge was a, was a crucial issue that we've been discussing ever since. I mean, that was one of the issues as to whether or not Mill Valley would even you know, would even buy its power from MEA. It was the issue of the of the risk of the PCIA uh, charge and the, and the and the cost of and also there, there's an exit fee, which was the other thing. Mm -hmm. But that's been the, the PCIA charge has been discussed continuously. Oh, I, I agree that it's always a issue. I'm just saying it's like filing a big lawsuit. And so I usually well, as a as a if I'm the client, I generally like my attorney to tell me what they're doing before they do it. I I think there, there's two levels to it. One, I think that what we do here is we set policy and we review the policy decisions uh, that we're dealing with. And so maybe you're right as long as there was no time constraint, maybe they should come to us and give us a uh, outline saying this is what we're thinking of doing. If that's strategically appropriate under the circumstances to go public before you actually file the petition, I don't actually know. But I also don't think that this would be something that you could go in closed session uh, with the Brown Act, because there's no litigation involved. Um, and there's very limited issues with regard to closed session on, on, on the Brown Act. So you could very well have the staff provide to us the issues that they want to pursue. You could also have the council come here and give us some more a, a legal basis of the strategy and the substance. I don't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, I don't know that we need to be writing it. Because frankly, I don't think well, we I could write it. I wasn't talking about writing it. I was agreeing with you. I think it's a policy issue. And I just yeah. want the board to be involved at the policy level. That's all. Yeah. I don't disagree with anything that I understand that they're doing here. Um, but I don't disagree with what you're saying either. Thank you. No, I think point well taken. I think the policy here is to go forth and challenge the PCI yeah. Yeah. in any manner. Yeah. Well, appropriate. That'll be a running there. policy. Yeah. Right. 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 I just would, would caution um, our board members uh, about making the inquiries of staff in a public meeting uh, regarding matters that could impinge on uh, attorney work product communications. Um, it's easy for us to put staff on the spot and inadvertently engage in some kind of waiver. And it's, it's really important to remember the nature of the opposition in all of these proceedings. I, I don't think you were here when, when we had a, a woman who's a staff attorney for the CPUC come and describe to us the resources in terms of numbers of lawyers that the staff has assigned to CCA matters. I think it was one, maybe two. And PG&E commensurately had, if I remember right, it was like 228, some unbelievably imbalanced number. And so our adversary, if you will, is incredibly well-financed uh, and, and well-armed. And there are no, no friends of ours, so we want to be very careful uh, in terms of while we're endeavoring to discharge our duties that we don't engage in any sort of uh, inadvertently compelled waivers that will hurt us in the, in the long run. Beth, anything else? Is anybody on board? this board not a lawyer? No. <laughs> 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 oh, we need you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the next item I want to touch on um, is the SB 790 Code of Conduct. 
Um, this is the proceeding that we previously discussed. Again, the cost allocation issues were excluded from the scope of this proceeding uh, and the petition, but the, for the remaining components, this is the code of conduct. Um, there are some, some good items that are coming out of this. It needs to be voted out by the end of the year. Um, and there are some not so good components of this. Uh, what some of the good components include, you know, the IOUs can't speak on our behalf. Doesn't sound like a big win, but it's 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 a move forward. Uh, you know, equal application of tariffs. A lot of these things sound common sense, um, but they're actually not rules that are currently in place. Um, there are some not so great components of this, such as um, there's a little bit in the proposed decision, this is not the final decision, so we we're submitting comments currently on this, is there is a a more <coughs> flexibility for the IOUs to lobby against CCA. Um, and there was an exclusion uh, for CCAs not being able to use the billing envelope on the same terms and conditions of the IOUs. So that was excluded from the code of conduct. Um, there is one very disconcerting provision, uh, which I apologize for all the text, um, but that this reaches really the ugly. Uh, which is um, relates to how investor-owned utilities can can um, persuade communities uh, from not uh, joining or, or participating in a CCA. So the there are current the current rules in place are sort of the original language, um, and the code of conduct proposes this new language. So essentially. Uh, to summarize what this says is, in the most cynical way possible, is a, an investor in utility, pg e could offer customers within a jurisdiction that's looking at, say, joining us or launching their own CCA um, to persuade that community to not launch a CCA. So energy efficiency programs, other programs that we have specifically dealt with in the past. That is a, that is a um, cynical but accurate um, analysis of the language. And furthermore, the the restriction. So trying to persuade the community said, you know, persuade governments to not participate in CCAs. Um, they could use other optional rates, programs, and services to persuade communities to not join a CCA. So. We hope this is a drafting error. Uh, we mm -hmm. have provided comments on this. Um, in this proceeding, that it has been a challenge. We've provided significant comments um, to develop really robust uh, code of conduct rules that relate to CCAs. Uh, we have not been successful. So uh, at this point, we're just trying to make changes around the margins to make the proposed decision a little bit more palatable. So we hope that we see some revisions to the proposed decision um, in, before it gets voted out on the 20th. Can, can you return just to the, the point about lobbying? Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the decision as far as their ability to lobby against yeah. CCA? Yeah, it's just, it's just a matter of what is considered lobbying and what is not considered lobbying. So. Um, what I'm referencing here, um, I can provide you with specific language at a later point in time, but uh, um, actually, so it, might, it might be it might be in your um, in your board packet actually. Okay. But the the lobbying just relates to lobbying shall not include X, Y, and Z, and it really it's similar language to what you're seeing down here. So lobbying does not include, you know, pushing rates, program services on um, customers. Or any benefit. And or, or providing service. or providing information to local governments. Information. Okay. Now could you okay. just translate this chunk of text one more time, please? Sure. Okay. So um, so the original to the black line, so without the strikeouts and without the underlining. So you really, just what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, it, it just means that so that's what's in effect right now, is what you're saying. 
other than the, the original cross text. Out and what is mm -hmm. exactly. This is, and so, and then this would be proposed, the revision to that language. Right. And so, who has proposed this? this the commission. Okay. The okay. California Public Utilities Commission has proposed this revision, which would significantly weaken the <coughs> rules relating to how IOUs, such as PG&E, can market against uh, CCA in local communities. So rather than providing, say, a service to a local government, they could provide a service to utility customers within that local government service territory. Um, and also, there, this additional weakening was also included, saying, well, we can offer programs that we have to folks in the community, local governments, as ways to persuade them to not join a CCA. Okay, so let me try to translate it for myself. Yeah. The, the, the original part basically means the, the, the notion was that the electrical corporations can't use their position and their power to offer services conditioning that offer on you, Mr. Customer, you can't go with marine energy. Is that the basic Yeah, exactly. Idea? You know, the, the IOUs can't use their standing or their essentially their power, power and, and their resources to dissuade communities from participating in community choice aggregation. Um, and the original rules really more strongly said, let the local government decide on its own. Don't in get involved in the decision-making process. They can evaluate the information and then determine whether or not they're going to become a CCA, but just don't, you know. This so it separated, it separated sandboxes, if you will. It, it said, PG&E, you got to stay in your sandbox. Don't go over there and mess with MEA's sandbox. Is that, <coughs> although crude, a fair um, articulation of the import of the rule? I would say it's more like the local government sandbox because it's the local mm -hmm. government's decision whether okay. or not to participate in a CCA. So. Okay. okay. And then, and then, so then the underlying part, that's the part to, to be added, and that's, that's the watered down part, right? Yep. So the watering down is what's struck out and what's added at the end. Okay. So, um, so again, it's a lot of text. And so then, that, so, I mean, optional, that would be just about anything because the customer's got the option to begin with whether to go with the CCA or whether to go with the IOU, right? Or is that not right? Well, some of you may remember um, not too long ago, um, many of your cities were lobbied by PG&E yeah. to um, not join this potential CCA because they were going to offer you these energy efficiency programs. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what this is about. So that what they did at that time um, was considered uh, by the CPUC Energy Division to be not okay. They're not supposed to interfere with the process. And what this language does is it actually sort of loosens up the restrictions that we, that we, we were all um, assuming were in place and allows a little more leeway for pg e to do exactly that same thing in other communities. Right, so, then, so really the impact, potential impact, while some on, on MEA uh, is more onerous with respect to other communities in the state uh, that may decide to, to uh, take advantage of the CCA opportunities. Yes, and it could also impact us here because they're able to go out and, um, and you know, try and win customers back by talking about their rates and their programs and that sort of thing. Right, okay. Can I just get one clarification on the, the last underlying, does that mean that they can go out in our communities and sort of pick off customers, bundle great customers, and pick them off and sort of undermine the support for a CCA by selecting big customers in each community, you know, grabbing their business and deterring the formation of a CCA. Isn't that really what that's allowing them to do? Well, the way I read this is it only applies to local governments. It doesn't apply Specifically, does not apply to individual electricity companies. Yeah. So, but you know, uh, uh, but but it also looks like, as bizarre as this may seem, because of the interlineation on the third and fourth lines, 
it looks like PG&E could in fact go to the individual customers and say, we'll give you a 50% rate deduction if you lobby your local government not to participate in the CCA. That's a concern. So it, the interlineation allows them to provide good services and programs to electric electricity customers who are not local governments, mm -hmm. which is kind of bizarre because it's kind of like paying them to lobby their local government. But the rest of it, the restrictions that it says the restriction does not apply to optional rates and those things, that only applies to, as I read it, as to present perhaps PG&E offering good services and programs to the local governments, meaning if PG&E didn't want Mill Valley to participate in the CCA, they could provide us uh, rate program services to the extent that we get bundled services. Yeah, you know, I think that the real core is just, and, and I do want to move on to the next slide after this, but, um, you know, it's fine that PG&E and other investor-owned utilities have, you know, rates, programs, and services that are authorized by the commission. That, we don't have a problem with that, but what we have a problem with is when you're leveraging commission-approved tariffs to to induce communities to not join CCA. That that just that crosses the line, and we find that to be unacceptable. Um, so you know, there's bound to be programs for which uh, bundled customers are eligible, but CCA customers would not be, and, and there are um, valid reasons for having those. But when it reaches a point where you're using those as a marketing tool to dissuade communities from interfering in a local community's decision to <coughs> participate in CCA, that we find to be wholly unacceptable. Well, it's clearly ambiguous. I mean, yeah. they're obviously trying to make a point at the end that they're, they're yeah. not correctly making because it implies yeah. something they may be saying above. Yeah. Um, so they do need to change that language. Yeah, so generally, just the gist is what I've been trying to show in these slides is, you know, don't be surprised if you don't see a bright, shining final decision coming out of this proceeding. Um, it's just a, a fair warning that sometimes you don't always <laughs> get what you sometimes you don't always get what you want. Um, and then the last item that I want to touch on is the PGE general rate case. Uh, phase one was filed. Uh, we're going to be participating in this. Uh, it just this first phase is going to relate to the reasonableness of uh, costs that that PGE is asking for recovery for. Um, I'll give you one example here and then uh, we can move on to the rest of the agenda, which is uh, PG&E wants to change its accounting for what it calls customer retention. And so that would be uh, inducing people back to uh, bundled service from CCA, from direct access, uh, dissuading communities from municipalizing, uh, dissuading communities from um, entering into CCA. Uh, they, instead of having that recovered from shareholders, which is what how those costs are currently recovered, they are asking that those costs be recovered from ratepayers. So we don't agree with that. Um, and you know, we're evaluating other portions of the, of the general rate case to um, look at these reasonableness of costs and whether it should be paid for by shareholders or, um, or by, uh, by ratepayers. And then phase two relates to how those costs are going to be, um, how those costs are going to be sort of divvied up among the different rate classes and rate design. So, um, apologies for taking the long. I, I did, was actually joking when I said I would take an hour. But so we're time. actually uh, losing some folks <laughs> now. Do we have any further questions or comments for Pat uh, from board or public? Doesn't look Absolutely. like it. So just to rehash, we're going to. Um, move item six, seven, and nine. Um, I, I believe we're losing the form, form. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we got uh, new telecommunications. Yeah, so why don't we just um, at this point say that we're going to move item six, seven, nine to the next meeting. Item 11 board members and staff matters. Just, just one item I wanted to yes. let folks know that um, Alex uh, DeGiorgio has, uh, has developed a very good and thorough PowerPoint presentation on our Richmond outreach. 
you can grab it on your way out and take a look and we'll be able to present it to the board at the next board meeting. Thank you, Don. With nothing further, we are adjourned. Wait, go. Why aren't you this good over?